Welcome. We are here with Professor Abraham Sedman. Welcome. It's great to be with you. Uh, professor at the University of Rochester and also the chairman of the D Health Summit. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very delighted to be here and uh, <clears throat> meet yourself as one of our, of our future speakers tomorrow. Yes. The D Health Summit is really uh, an exciting event and we are looking forward for Record number of participants, almost 240, were booked solid for the event tomorrow. So wow. it's a very exciting event. So tell us about the, how D-Health got started and, and really what the, the mission and goal of, of the D-Health Summit really is about. It's very interesting because it kind of evolved over time. I started working with a colleague, Professor Ray Dorsey, who is a neurologist at the University of Rochester. And over the years, we've done a lot of uh, breakthrough work with other colleagues on using telemedicine for treating primarily Parkinson patients. Mm. As we wanted to spread the word to the uh, policymakers and other, we realized beyond scientific publication, which we had in some of the leading medical journals and management journal, we need to do something of broader base. And we came with the idea of the uh, D Health Summit, the D stands either for disruptive health or for digital health, but we don't tell anybody, it's uh -huh. secret, okay? But the notion is technology matters a lot when it comes to medicine, and I can share with you some of our insights on it so far. And the idea was basically, given our experience and our success and frustrations, to develop a meeting that will have three legs. One leg are senior politicians from Washington and from the state level, because in the American system, politician decides what gets covered and what does not get covered, okay? Especially in, what doesn't get covered. Or what doesn't get, <laughs> at least in general terms, they don't go drug by drug, but they provide fairly detailed guidelines, okay? The second element of the triangle are individual like yourself who are promoting, funding, and innovating new technologies into the air of healthcare. So it's either the VCs, the entrepreneurs, the facilitators, etc. So these are the spring of new ideas which come in constantly and we need to encourage it. And the third element of the triangle are leading physicians, mm. geriatrician, neurologist, deans of medical school, etc. what we call the lighthouse physician, who determine basically whether those innovations which are coming all the time make sense clinically, socially, and economically. So by combining the politicians, the innovators, and the leading clinicians, we get a very interesting platform of discussion. And over the first two years, we had a tremendous number of connections that were forged in those meetings. So we want to educate, but we equally want to learn and develop a community that promotes the use of digital technology in uh, getting better health. I think something magic happens when you bring all these different types of people um, it's a global audience as well. Like, it's, it's extraordinary leaders, it seems like, from all over the U.S., but also coming from other countries. Um, what do you hope happens uh, in terms of action from this? Is it new innovations? Is it progress in some fashion? We get fashion? several outcomes as a result. Besides educating ourselves, we are curious animals, so we want to learn. But primarily what we would like to happen is three different outputs. The first one, we would like to forge connections. And we have individuals who are looking for ideas, and individuals who come with the idea are looking for support. Or in medicine in particular, they are looking for a playground, a place where they can try their ideas safely with patients, with animal model, etc. So medicine is based on a lot of collaboration. It's a highly regulated field, and the more connections you have, easier to move forward. That's the first thing we want. The second thing we want to... Uh, come out with what we have done in the last meeting, policy documents. Inform the decision makers on both sides of the aisle in Washington, where healthcare, as we all know, is a hot topic, or even the third rail, some will say. What we think, as we focus primarily on uh, aging Americans, are the key issues and emerging solutions. And the third element that is very important for us is the following. Because we focus on aging, but primarily on what we call aging in place. Mm -hmm. This is a combination of social process and technological solutions. And aging support requires a fair amount of labor. So we hope to find solution that will do what we call as economists, capital to labor substitution. Reduce the amount of labor 
with the use of technology to make it easier for individuals to stay in a dignified way in their home as long as possible. The world is really going through extraordinary uh, times. People are living longer. Um, people's health needs are, are different. Chronic disease epidemics, um, you know, big, big, big challenges. Um, what's your outlook on where we are and where the future takes us in terms of these health challenges and, and the innovation that will be needed to solve some of them? This is a very difficult challenge. It's one of the things we are doing in the meeting, today we are running a visioning session together with our partner, which is West Health. West Health is a foundation based in California that focuses primarily on supporting what we will call aging in place or dignified aging. Mm -hmm. It all strata of the society. And we bring in a group of experts from all over the US trying to come up with the future vision, what are the needs of aging Americans on all dimensions? And what are the policy implications of those needs? The, the picture in the US is very interesting because every day we have around 10,000 people crossing the age of 65. Mm. Some of them eventually pass away, as everybody does, but the amount of Americans over the age of 65, i.e. on Medicare, in 2030, which is our focus of the DHEL Summit, will probably exceed 60 to 65 million within 13 years or so. That's a very large population. Those people do vote, they have an opinion, and they would like to maintain as a normal lifestyle as possible. The other problem is the overall mobility of society tends to increase. People get fatter, there is much greater incidence of diabetics and other chronic diseases, which puts a huge burden on our medical system. So one of the things we find out, it's out of the scope of our meeting, but it's something that should be discussed, is the fact that your diseases at a later age are an outcome of lifestyle and genetics and environment factor from your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50. So one question that is still open is, who will pay for preventive care? Mm -hmm. Who will pay today to prevent diseases that will come out and manifest themselves 15, 20 years from now? That's an open issue which is fairly difficult to handle so far, but that's some of the issues we'd like to address. There's so many issues there because it starts even before your 20s. It starts when you're, before you're born, really, um, in terms Genetics of prevention. Empathy, yeah. and, and the early years of life. So um, what's your outlook on, on what you're most excited about and are you feeling optimistic about progress being made in terms of solving some of these challenges? I'm very excited about I would say on the technological side, on three major development. One is over the past 10 years or so, most of the American healthcare system moved into electronic medical records. As a result, we have unprecedented amount of data that we start to collect on patients. So now we know what works, what doesn't work, which physician keep patient healthy so they don't come back, and which physician does do a good job and the patient keep coming again and again with increasing level of morbidity and complications. We didn't have this data almost 10 years ago, so this is phenomenally great development. The second thing I'm very excited about is the whole scientific progress in the area of big data, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and analytics. We are only starting to scratch the surface as to how to use those technologies in providing care for patients. The third area, which is close to my heart because of our pioneering involvement there, is telemedicine. And what we find on telemedicine is very interesting because that's an example where technology can become a power multiplier for the individual physician. And the results we had in several areas show that the clinical as well as the economic outcome are really impressive. Mm. And let's dig into the telemedicine uh, for a bit because it seems like it's finally uh, getting its due in terms of recognition as, as an opportunity to solve some really big challenges around access as well. Um, what new innovations are going on? What is telemedicine going to change? What's it going to help both patients and physicians sort of uh, in terms of outcomes? Um, what are some examples? I, I can speak with more confidence about things I was involved in myself. Yeah, sure. Uh, with uh, Professor Dorsey and some other colleagues. Uh, in general, what we find is telemedicine at some aspects can operate as a complement 
to face-to-face -face visits or to uh, clinical visits. In other time, it could be a substitute. So one question is, of course, when we look at telemedicine, is it a complete substitute? No. Is it a complete complement? No. It's somewhere in between. Our research was focusing primarily on chronic care, chronically ill patients, which is about three quarters of our national healthcare budget. So these patients need to see the physician periodically, typically between two to four times a year, depends on the level of complications they're facing. And if I can save them the travel, this is a phenomenal factor. So the patients definitely do benefit. The question that was asked early on is, what about clinical outcomes? Mm. And earlier research indications are that in the field we've been looking at, which is diabetic retinopathy prevention, uh, chronic migraine and uh, motion disorder, primarily Parkinson's disease, clinical outcome in general, it depends on case by case, are equal, sometimes even superior to those done with their face-to-face -face visits. One of the reasons is better accessibility of the physician. Now, the problem we face is very simple. Over the next few years, we start feeling tremendous shortage of physicians in right. the U.S. And, several, and globally. And too. globally. And part of the problem in the U.S. is American physicians are highly regarded, and wealthy individuals all over the world would love to get our physicians. So we'll be squeezed out one way or another. We see it already with certain countries who are getting advice from our physician. It, the patients fly here or they fly out our physician or call them with telemedicine and they pay them handsomely. So this competition for physician time will only increase here. So one of the interesting things we found with telemedicine research in our empirical work, it can make the physician more productive. Simple example, we've seen cases where a patient come and see the physician for 30 minutes, whereas in the telemedicine visit, they're equally happy after 20 minutes visit. Why? Because you did not have to have the long travel. And you have a long ride, you make a long laundry list of questions. Whereas if the physician visits you at home virtually, I know he or she are around the corner. If I have a question, I'll call them later. I right. don't insist on checking all my questions on a laundry list. So if I can increase physician productivity by 20 to 30%, that's a lot. Mm. So we are very fortunate. We get to work with entrepreneurs and innovators every day. We call them health transformers. Um, what are your lessons learned? What advice do you have for entrepreneurs just getting started today that are, are redesigning or trying to rethink the future of health and wellness and healthcare? What should they be focusing on? That is a tough question because I have one leg as an academician and another leg is an entrepreneur, so I'm trying to shift between weights. One thing I find is that most physicians I come across in my capacity, so to speak, as a developer, as an entrepreneur, as a researcher, are eager to collaborate. They're very curious, intellectually bright, and they really would like to try new things. They are very open-minded, and they go out of the way to work with whoever comes with a good idea. That's one piece of good news. The other thing which I find amazing and very encouraging is the fact that technology today is so powerful that we can do a lot. On the downside, I find that the medical system per se is very conservative and slow to adapt. It's highly regulated. Everything has been tested through the prism of reimbursement. Nobody wants to pay out of pocket. Everybody is looking for a rich uncle, i.e. the insurance company or the government to pay for any innovations, which is disappointing. And f the fourth element that I think entrepreneurs should be aware of is the following. Most senior managers of healthcare system that I happen to come across are primarily interested in one thing and one thing only. Maybe it's element of survival. How do I increase my top line revenues? Mm. Everything else is secondary. And I've not seen many digital innovation that come across to do it in a proper way. Yeah, the business models are in a state of chaos right now and, and exploring what the future business models are. Um, as you see new companies come 
come around are, are not enough focusing on, on how to make money, how to increase that top line revenue? Is that, is that what you're seeing? It depends. One of the issues we see primarily with startups where physicians are involved, it's hard to generalize, but in general, the training of physician is to work solo. I operate on the patient. I'm replacing the cardiac valve of the patient. I'm bandaging the patient. I'm analyzing the patient if it's psychiatry. So for physician, by virtue of training, it's very difficult to understand how to scale up. But the whole idea of a startup, you want to develop a prototype, test it, try it, and then to scale up. So it's kind of hard for them to understand what is the migration path for successful scaling up. It's not only the marketing, it's how you get acceptance, how you go to the licensure, and how you let go and let somebody else do the professional management. Because physicians don't outsource, they do the work themselves. Mm. So I find this is a major bear for many. I've seen few who know how to do it, but many who struggle with it psychologically as well as economically. So tell me a little more about your background. When did you first or how did you get involved in, in health and, and health care and, and maybe um, your beginning as an entrepreneur? You've I done so many things. I, I've, I've been lucky, and I'm a very curious animal, so that, I think, my, my biggest drive. I do things which interest me, and I do things that I hope help others. So I started my medical journey after I got tenured as a full professor in a church faculty very quickly at the University of Rochester Business School. And I came from uh, the computer information system side and the management science side, which are the quantitative aspects of management. And I went and studied medical imaging and very quickly became a national expert in the field of medical imaging management, radiology management, if you want the old terminology. And I've had the pleasure of working with many of the leading medical centers all over the US in almost all medical centers whether it's in consulting, on project, research, training, etc., And I've done it for quite a 15 years or so, 17 years, and then I felt, okay, it's time to change. And I partner with the, our neurology group at the University of Rochester with the leadership of Dr. Dawson. We started doing telemedicine, which I find very exciting. And as I mentioned, we got some amazing results and we keep pushing on this frontier because it's much easier to move data than to move patients, mm. okay? Now, in addition, that's, I- That's a good quote there, I like that. It's much easier to move da data than to patients. To move patients, particularly if there's a Parkinson patient. Now, the other thing we find out that in the course of dealing with medical school, I find that their number one challenge is getting young talent, young physicians. And if I'm a big fan of the New York Knicks, but I didn't have many happy years recently. They're not winning as much <laughs> as I would like them to win, and that's a different discussion. <laughs> but in basketball or in baseball or in soccer in any field, you're only as good as the team you have. You need a good manager, you need a good coach, but we all know the story of Cleveland. You bring in the star and you start winning, okay? So we develop a startup called Third Friday, this trademark name, and the idea basically to help residents program attract the best applicants to their program for interview and hopefully to rank them high and hire them as residents with the hope that many of them will stay for fellowship and join the staff. And what we find out is that with the proper digital technology, we've been using it uh, over two years, you can really get much better applicants for those who use the right technology in managing the applicants and bring them over. So this is something I find very encouraging. And uh, we started the first year with the uh, alpha sites of about two hospitals. Very quickly, several friends called me and said, we'd like to join in, and we put them in. And we keep growing. We passed several dozens already, and kind of we slowly keep expanding our territory. But the response we get is, yeah, we love to work with the technology. The reason being simple. Young millennials don't like to make phone calls. They don't like to use email. So we develop a system where they don't have to use phone or email, and they can still get the interview scheduled, and it helps the program attract better talent, which is very important for them. Because mm. you're only as good as the talent you can recruit. That's true, that's true. 
Um, so if you could wave a magic wand and, and solve one big challenge today that you've seen either with health or in the healthcare industry that you think would make a, the biggest impact, what, what would that change be? What would that wish be to change something? I will do one thing. I will try to work with all the major stakeholders on a national standard for electronic medical record. So it will be easy to exchange data the way banks are exchanging data with each other with IBA number or SWIFT to exchange data records among the system. I think it's achievable. It takes some coordination, but if we do it right, it will be tremendous boost for technological innovation for anybody who moves into the field because the fact that every hospital or every system uses Is slightly different yeah. electronic medical records or a different patient identification logic makes it very difficult to come with good universal solutions. So why do you think this is? I mean, tens of billions of dollars have been spent trying to solve this very challenge. Um, you know, it's been worked on for a long time now. Why is this issue with interoperability and data silos, why does it exist in specifically in healthcare? There, there are several reasons for them. One is the whole concept of patient confidentiality. We try to protect patient identity. And it's complicated because I would like to share the data, but if I'm your dentist, I may or may not be privilege to data that happened to you at age 12 or age 14, any abuse you have had been to, etc., etc. So what data is shared by whom and for whom is a complicated societal, ethical issue as well as technological issue, but it's addressable. The other problem is we operate the healthcare system like a bank with every branch manager is independently buying their own saving account management software. And I cannot have any picture of my assets and liability as a bank if every branch is buying the only little piece of software. But that's how we operate as a nation, which to me is simply unacceptable. Mm. So the historical reason, uh, we believe in freedom of choice, but I think standards, what we have right now is a railroad system when everybody is a different width between the tracks. Right. So we cannot move the cars from one, from one system to another. That's how the subways used to work in New York City. With the three different systems, right. right. Luckily, we connected it, and it will come. But the sooner we do it, the better off everybody's going to be. So do you think it's possible or likely, perhaps, that a new type of company, perhaps a technology company, leapfrogs the current systems and creates a completely new data infrastructure, specifically around medical records? I think of companies today that have massive, massive amounts of data Amazon, Google, Apple. Um, these companies arguably have more information, not just about my health, but other things I'm doing related exactly. to my lifestyle. So couldn't one of and these companies- And trust them more, and most and of us trust them more than we, we, a lot of young individuals trust Google more than they trust the bank or the life insurance company. I mean, couldn't one of these companies come in, buy the top three, companies, the epics of the world, just buy them with the mounds of cash they're sitting on and essentially turn them off and turn their own system on and, and change the game overnight? Do you think that's possible or is this just a pipe dream? In, you in know, the there's a head? saying, it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. <laughs> and I will not try to make a prediction, though I think there's a glaring need for it. I'll give you just one simple example. I happen to be involved in developing electronic medical record in Israel through a system called Epic, uh, Clicks. And Clicks has been in operations for around 20 years or so, give or take, and covering around 5 million live, plus or minus, okay, I've been out of it, so I'm not up to date on the numbers. The total revenue has been $10 million. So the cost was like $2 per, per live per year, which is minuscule compared with the prices we pay here. The advantage has been that almost all the population was covered by one standardized system. So it was very easy to exchange data, to go to specialists, to get second opinion, third opinion, move data from hospital to hospital. So I grew up in a system when data interoperability was not an issue. And when I see the siloed structure here, it's really scary. Mm. 
even if you look at maternity follow-up, for example, when a woman goes to different imaging center with different follow-up, they move cities, whether it's on job and so on, and it's very hard for them to get one picture just on a nine-month maternity follow-up. It's still a technological challenge. So I think it's something the government should take charge of. I think, to answer your question, a good way to start, if I were a king, would be to allow patients to download all the medical data which is structured on them by Epic or whoever takes care of them. Because legally, we do own the data as patients. Right, it's ours. But we never ask for it, and there's no way for us to get it on a USB drive or on a cloud or any other way. I own it, but I can never possess right. it. If we allow patients to download the data and get it, then innovation will come up like mm. bushfire. So last, last question. Um, I always like to learn what people do to stay healthy themselves. Do you have any good health advice, uh, things that you do personally to, to stay healthy? Most important thing is to do what you love yes. and love what you do. That's important. Uh, personally, uh, I became vegan uh, about seven years ago following the, reading the book by Dr. Joel Foreman, Eat to Live, and the China study. And I would recommend it to anybody who wants to take care of themselves at any age, because it's been for me a phenomenal change in the way I, I feel, I operate, my concentration. And the more research I read, it's the way to go. I think if we can convert all our American population for vegan, we'll cut our healthcare costs seriously by 50%. Wow. That's tremendous. Well, thank you so much. It's my I'm, pleasure. I'm looking forward to Likewise. the summit tomorrow okay. and, and honored tonight. to spend, and tonight we've got tonight. an event. Um, honored to spend time with you. Thank you.